Very good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arno Beas. In the name of AFCO, I have uh, the pleasure to welcome you to our um, uh, deep dive today. You know, the deep dives are a series of um, uh, online events where our uh, members uh, present their activities, their innovation, um, new concepts or subjects uh, um, of the um, um, uh, present concern. And um, today we have the pleasure and uh, to week, uh, welcome Butcher Shop and uh, Nina uh, Müller will uh, present the activity of, um, of Butcher Shop. Um, we will record this presentation. This will be made available after uh, the presentation. You will be able to, uh, to watch it uh, again. At the same time, the uh, slides will be also made available right after the presentation. And um, generally speaking, if you miss one hour event, you can always um, um, subscribe to our newsletter and uh, catch up with the next ones. So um, now we will uh, make a journey in the risk assessment 2.0. Uh, fasten your seatbelt. The subject is fascinating. And um, Nina, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm talking to you today from San Jose, California. So I'm on the other side of the world. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about, um, just like Arno said, uh, risk assessment and um, how to increase the success rate of your portfolio, get high returns and save time using a methodology that we at Butcher Shop um, use uh, very, very often. Um, it's part of our ethos. And so I'm very excited to talk to you about that today. Um, really quick, just overview of what I'm going to be talking through. I'm going to do some quick introductions. Um, I'm going to talk about our approach, talking about the pre-mortem, giving a little bit of background on what that is. Um, our assessment, based on our experience of where this fits into the VC world and the VC process within the risk assessment process. Um, and then I'm very excited. I have a guest speaker here today, Mr. Kelly Max, a CEO and founder of Solve who um, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with, and he will be able to talk a little bit about how this method has also helped him. So quick introductions about myself. So I am Nina Mueller. I'm the Global Program Director of Butcher Shop Europe. Um, I've been in the agency space for over 10 years now, working with a whole slew of different type of companies from many startups, um, all the way to giants such as Symantec, RingCentral, Nike, um, I've been a butcher shop for about um, almost six years now, started over in San Francisco, and I actually live in Germany. I'm just visiting family here in California right now. Um, I'm the co-founder of Prio. Um, we're going to be talking about this a little bit later, but this is the digitized app for the pre-mortem methodology. Um, I am an angel investor. Um, I am a mentor. Mentorship is very important to me. I've been very lucky in my past to have some great mentors in my time, so I find it very important to give back. I am from the Silicon Valley, born and raised in San Jose. Um, I have German roots, German mother. Ich kann auch Deutsch sprechen, but today I'm going to speak English. Um, and I'm also a new mama of a baby boy, six months old, um, which is my, my pride and joy. So a little bit about Butcher Shop. We are a global growth and transformation company. We started out in San Francisco. Um, and we now have offices and hubs in LA, New York, Chicago, uh, Guadalajara, and now newly also in Vienna. So you'll be seeing a lot more of us, uh, which I'm very excited about. And we connect um, creativity and consulting, and we help companies break in and out of emerging markets at very important inflection points of their business. So if they're looking to enter a new market, if they're looking to change something structural about their company, if they're looking to completely reinvent their positioning, or if they're looking to move from series A to B to C, those are very important inflection point, points in companies. And that's butcher shops, bread and butter. That's where we come in and help consult using discovery, brand, design, creativity, and so forth to help them um, succeed, grow, and evolve. And we have a very strong emphasis on 
maximizing clarity. So our ethos is to help people. And the most helpful thing that we can do is to maximize clarity in absolutely everything we do. And we use that with our beat failure methodology, um, which the core of that is the pre-mortem. So I'll be talking about that shortly as well, but we use beat failure methodology in our business development, in our client relations, in the way we approach our work, and also internally at Butcher Shop when we're evolving our culture and we're doing internal initiatives. So we've been around for about 15 years now. We have a very typical Silicon Valley story. Our uh, wonderful CEO, Trevor Hubbard, started Butcher Shop in a garage with $200 and an internet connection. Um, sort of sounds like an episode from the show Silicon Valley, um, but it's true. And since then, we've had the pleasure of working with some of the most innovative market leaders, international players and startups in Silicon Valley all the way to Europe. And like I said, we help them move from very important inflection points in their company. We've helped companies IPO, we worked with Fortune 500s, and we help startups in very important moments of their growth. And on the basis of this approach, we've become a very trustworthy partner to help them in the Nina, you're muted. Did somebody mute me by accident? <laughs> Have I been muted this whole time? <laughs> no. Um, thank you. We've worked with um, lots of different type of companies here. So also Halfa in the Dach region, from Google to Facebook, but also now in the Austrian space, had the pleasure of being able to partner with uh, VKO um, and Austrian startups and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just some numbers, we have um, been able to help ventures raise more than $16 billion. Um, we've helped over 20 companies reach unicorn status. We've had over 600 client partners, but we are very intentional and very specific about who we get to work with and who we get to help. So we don't take on more than 25 clients um, per year to be very, very specific and very, um, very helpful for these kind of companies. So. Our approach, talking a little bit about our background here and why the premortem is so important. After 15 years of working with all these different types of CEOs and entrepreneurs and pioneers, we've observed a trend and that's that people focus way too much on success. And we feel like this is a wrong approach. We want to be successful. That's our goal. If we're successful, our companies are successful, everyone's happy. But the approach and how you are doing your work we feel like this is the wrong mindset because the list of successes or what success looks like is short. It could be raising a certain amount of money. It could be getting brand awareness. It could be hitting a certain type of KPI for your traffic, but it's usually a short list of what success looks like. If you flip it on your head and you talk about, okay, well, what does failure look like? What are all the things that could cause us to fail? That list is very long and nobody tackles the way they're thinking and their thought processes that way. And so that's sort of the core and the gist of, of what we believe needs to be talked about. And by talking about success too much, there tend to be blind spots and gaps. Um, there are gaps in strategic approach. It can generate higher costs because you're approaching things the wrong thing, the wrong way. Um, it can create mistrust and alignment and so forth. So I'll be talking more about that as well. So we designed our beat failure approach to maximize clarity and create powerful strategies, clear accountability and tangible execution plans. It is the most valuable method in strategic decision-making. And we don't want to fail fast or fail often. There's this stigma around failure and sort of coming from the Silicon Valley, people think that you can fail often, it's okay, just keep going. Well, we know that people don't have that luxury. We don't want to fail often. We don't want to fail fast. We don't want to fail at all. So our methodology is to beat failure and to avoid it and prevent it altogether. And I love this. Um, our our uh, head of creative, Ben McNutt, always says this. You don't build a rocket ship for the best case scenario. You build it for the worst case scenario. Um, and that's essentially the, the thought process and thinking behind things. We obviously want our rocket ship to be successful and do all the things it's supposed to do, but we want to make sure that we are covering all the ground to ensure that we have covered the ground for the worst case scenario. So our recipe for a success requires a perspective shift. So 
thinking about success, but also let's talk about failure and approach it that way as well. And the way we're approaching our work and talking about, okay, what's going to cause us to fail in this moment? And a resilient strategy is based on anticipating failures. And this is going to make your decision making in your investments or whatever you're doing bulletproof. And that's our mission at Butcher Shop as well. We want to make sure it's bulletproof. And there's a huge problem with decision making in general. The process can be flawed. It's based on subjectivity, human error, conflicting opinions. Very often there's one voice in the room. So we always want to orient around objective points of orientation. We want to be as objective as possible in our decision making. Because today's success rate of intent lays somewhere between 10 to 30 percent. And we want to move that up to 70 to 100 percent success rate. So our prompt is what would make something fail? What's going to make the company fail? What's going to make your go-to market approach fail? What's going to make your Q4 strategy fail? So everyone maybe start thinking about what are you doing right now and how could you use this prompt in something that you're doing? So when would you use something like this? Well, there's signals of when our approach can help you. Um, if you're unsure of next steps, if you're doing a change in strategy, if you're working with people you never worked with before, um, it's these are all very good signals to think about, okay, maybe I need to start thinking about what could cause us to fail. If you're vetting a new partner or if a startup is vetting a new investor, this is a great moment to use this methodology. So, this is a study here. If only 5% of businesses succeed in the long run, why isn't there a stronger process of beating failure? So if half of businesses fail at the five-year milestone. People don't like to talk about failure. It's not a popular topic. There is an absolute stigma around it. And that's also because risk-taking is hard. By, by, by approaching failure and trying to succeed, we're taking risks. And failure is at the forefront of the VC world. You're trying to succeed. You're trying to avoid failure. And it's in the front of the VC world even more so than when investing in already established companies or in the stock market or so forth. And, um, you know, risks are higher, but so is the possibility of a high return. So taking calculated risks is hard, and we know that. Um, but moreover, it's also not unheard of that 6% of VCs' portfolios lead to 60% of the returns. Um, and earnings can be tight. It's hard to reach high evaluations. So would you be willing to use a method that has the potential to take your returns from 6% to 96%? We're wanting to increase our chances of success here by avoiding failure. So currently, based on our research, based on our experience, um, what the current risk assessment landscape looks like right now in the VC world is that there's a lot of conversations around growth and market potential. Um, a lot of balance sheets right now, they don't really reflect reality. They're very often recalculated by investors or sort of We've all heard of the promised um, best case scenario where that founders are envisioning for their companies, um, which makes it sort of hard to create realistic risk assessments because a lot of the information that's coming to you is very inflated and perhaps overvalued. Um, and a big vision and strong financial forecasts are required in order to get attention in those pitch post conversations. So the real process actually happens for investors when you're looking behind the curtain, when you're pulling it back and you're peeling back the layers and you're able to assess it yourself. So there are specific go-to market strategies that are assessed. Um, there's potential disruptions you're taking in, like economic crises, a pandemic, things like that. Um, the founder skill set, who are you working with? You're probably making some calls to people to also understand um, some references and gather those and speak with other VCs. Well, from all that information that we've learned, there really is no standard or one method that VCs are using for their risk assessment. It's sort of this list of things that I just talked through. People have their own process and it changes constantly. And so we wanna propose something that can be um, much more consistent that can be brought into your process.
and that is the pre-mortem. And there are a few players already in the global VC space who have been able to implement the pre-mortem efficiently and successfully. Um, and the pre-mortem is the basis of our beat failure methodology. And we believe that similar to what Scrum method is for developers, we believe that pre-mortem can be that for investors and in the VC space. Real quick, where it comes from, um, it comes from Wharton Business School. We did not invent the pre-mortem. I'm sure people here have heard of the post-mortem, um, but the pre-mortem um, was, was founded actually by engineers at Wharton Business School, and they found that imagining if an event had already happened increases the ability to correctly identify the reasons and to, um, to change the future outcomes by 30%. And so that's where it stems from. And what it does is identifies potential failures. It provides a scoring system. So I'm going to talk through that a little bit more shortly, just to give you more information on really what the pre-mortem is. It gives you clear accountability um, and builds trust. And it ultimately, ultimately gives you a joint strategy. Um, and here on the right are just some names of people who have um, been using this already um, to address challenges um, that sort of go beyond the common SWOT analysis of identifying weaknesses and strengths. So real quick, what's the pre-mortem? I'm gonna walk you through the process at a super high level. So the prompt, what's gonna cause XYZ to fail? What you're going to do is the first step is you're going to list your concerns. You can do this by yourself. You can do this with a group. It's powerful with a group together of key stakeholders and decision makers. You're going to list all the answers to that question. What will cause your company? What will cause your investment? What will cause the startup to fail? The next step, once you have all those written out individually, is there's the scoring system. And this is sort of the bread and butter of the pre-mortem. There's a scoring system, you rank them on a scale of one to 10, and you're going to multiply it by the likelihood and the impact. So what is the likelihood that your answer is going to happen on a scale of one to 10? One being not very likely, 10 being highly uh, likely. And then you multiply that by the impact on a scale of one to 10. So if your answer is to happen, 10 would be high impact catastrophic, big problem, one would be low impact, five would be in the middle. I'll walk you through an example shortly. And lastly, what you do is you assign accountability to the highest ranked items. And then you can go into solution prevention planning on how to prevent those failures from happening. So just some fun examples here. What would make our investment fail? Maybe someone saying, well, we haven't checked our references. We need to do due diligence and do our background check. Maybe we don't offer enough of our support. Maybe that we're the experts and we're not able to help. And that could really affect our investment as well. Um, maybe we don't understand the market. We haven't done enough strategy and background um, and research and discovery. Those are some example answers to that. How would you rate those? Well, the likelihood to don't check references. That's a low likelihood. Maybe you're saying, I check references, we've talked to other VCs, we've done our due diligence, that's a low likelihood. Well, the impact would be a 10 if we did not. That would be bad. Our score is 20, that's low. Next one, as an example, we don't offer our support. Maybe the likelihood there is high. You don't have enough time. You have a lot of portfolio clients. You don't have time to go in there and constantly provide your expertise and babysit and check in and do status and all those meetings that it takes Maybe that's the high likelihood that you can't offer your support. What's the impact? Nine, pretty high because you know that you can help. So that number is higher. You all of a sudden have a 63. Next one, as an example, you don't understand the market. Likelihood five, maybe you need to do more research. Um, impact 10, very high. What you do is you want to get rid of your lowest ranked ones. We're not worried about those. We focus on the highest ones. And then you can assign those to someone and talk about how to prevent those from happening. Now, I just went through that very quickly. If you do this with a group of people, you might have 50 of these and you just want to focus on the top three to five. So basically what this is doing is it's giving you a platform to talk about failure in a constructive way. The scores are based on an objective methodology and a framework to rank your risks. Uh, it creates clear accountability. Um, and you can create that joint strategy and action plan in the solution brainstorming piece. And it's very simple. We want to save time. We're all in too many meetings. And that's the beauty of this. You can do it within an hour easily. 
So we broke down a few phases where we feel like this can really be beneficial and help you. So the pre-investment discovery phase. Um, the process so far from what we've learned is during the discovery phase, you're really getting red flags out of the way, like hard facts such as what sector they're in, what phase, um, what geographical focus. Um, you're having discovery calls and meetings with potential portfolio startups to uncover all of these red flags. Um, next comes the dil due diligence process. So you're analyzing different details using different methodologies. And lastly, in the discovery phase, you're also, um, they're sort of the human element. You're actually investing in a person. There is a judgment of character, a knowledge, a skill set that needs to be assessed and um, judged. And that's tricky. That's really tricky to do these days. Like, do does the founder, does the founding team have what it takes? That can be difficult to assess right away. So we feel like the pre-mortem is actually a great moment for this to address any core concerns of potential risk. So some prompts you'd be using is what would cause your company to fail in the next one to three um, years? What's the likelihood and impact of these individual identified risks? And once you have a clear list of these uh, uh, obstacles, you can interrogate each one further and dive into each one and then get your ranked items to see really which are the ones that are the top risk items. And you're going to get absolute clarity in how well the founder is prepared for the future by anticipating failures and what's their ability to build a strategy to prevent those. That's incredibly valuable, valuable to be able to do that so early on in the process versus later in the process after sort of board meetings and those initial sign sheets. You can do this upfront immediately to really gauge the founder. Um, it's an early opportunity to problem solve together. So can you work together? Can you um, assess the situation together? Um, it also brings out blind spot analysis. It's incredibly hard to plan for the unknown or to navigate the unknown. So this will sort of help fill in those blind spots. Um, and yeah, how does the founding team and VC interact when there's identified failure moments together? So this is a great moment to do in your pre-discovery. Also, um, showing your worth. So obviously you'd be investing in a company that's incredibly valuable, but how are you personally, or how is your team contributing to the success of the startup? So how are you gonna to contribute to that? Well, in the global pool of accessible investors, you know, stakeholders frequently face a certain competition which they can overcome if they bring their value across. So how do you build trust and share your expertise based on the individual startup's need in a consistent way. Currently, what we've heard, some quotes, we only want to invest in somewhere where we bring value, which, which we, we, makes sense. Um, many founder and investor conversations are verbal. Um, they're not really in any kind of written form, um, so there isn't really a strong process or reporting surrounding that. Um, and it's often that after the first board, board meeting is where joint strategies are being built. So we feel that you can create an advantage for yourself in this moment. Doesn't it create a huge selling proposition for you as an investor? If you already address these and, and bring in your ideas for a resilient action plan before signing a term sheet, that could be very interesting. So this is exactly where trust and clarity is built, is using the pre-mortem. It gives you that platform to do this. So you can collect and discuss what potential failures could cause the company to fail. You can. This is the moment where you can bring in your expertise, remind the founder and the founding team of your role, um, and also in this uh, solution brainstorm process. So once you have your identified top-ranked failure items, you can then bring in your expertise in terms of how you think you can prevent those from happening by talking about what do you know, what do you need to do, what are the dependencies and who's responsible. Last phase, um, cap table coordination. This is another phase where we feel the pre-mortem can be very helpful. Um, typically things are a little bit rosier and a little bit lighter before the first round is closed and the first, first board meeting approaches. And so unexpected risks and challenges are usually discussed at that time afterwards. So the better the coordination communication between founders and the potential investors, the less surprises after the term sheet signature. So you're maximizing clarity 
and coordinating efficiently between stakeholders as early as possible. Currently, um, we heard a few times that people don't really want to follow a method or they don't dare to follow a method because it's so unique each time, which is so great about the pre-mortem is it's not this hard tool. You can use it, you can use it flexible, you can be flexible with the way you use it. It's to help you um, to help you with your strategy and help your decision making. Um, similar to Scrum, when coordinating a diverse team, a method does come in handy, but people aren't really using one. Um, so why not use the, uh, the pre-mortem method here once again? So you can build a successful strategy with a clear roadmap, priorities, and expectations and responsibilities. So you can make this final step of the cap table much smoother. And you can save a lot of time. This is the time where you're losing a lot of time in meetings and coordination and organization and administration things. So by getting people together and conducting a pre-mortem together, you're ultimately going to save time. So in this moment for the cap table, what you could do is, again, use your prompt. What's going to cause this company to fail? What can cause our cap table coordination to fail? You can adjust the, um, the title of your pre-mortem to that. You're going to group your anticipated failures together. You're going to score them. You're going to select the priorities based on the highest score. And then you're going to brainstorm solutions on what you can do to prevent those scores from happening and then assign those um, to individuals. You know, you are expected to present plans and you're expected to present your contribution to the company's growth. So coming with a strategy like this in moments where it gets a little bit hectic is going to help keep things really tight and aligned with everybody. So it's a great moment to exercise this beat failure approach to make this final step run smoothly. So overall, the pre-mortem um, is proven to be a credible tool to maximize success in risk assessment moments in the VC world. So I have a special guest today, um, Kelly Max. I have a real life example for Solve. So Kelly, I'm going to hand it over to you and I will continue to uh, click. Just let me know when. Thank you, can Nina. Me, uh, can you may I just uh, jump in, in in the conversation just before yeah. you start? Um, I would like to invite the audience to start to ask like, their questions um, in the chat so that we can be ready for the Q&A just after your, um, your uh, presentation, Kelly. Is that, is that okay? So now your turn, sorry for this uh, short interruption. Oh, no worries, uh, Bruno. Um, thank you, Nina. Uh, good morning, uh, good abend, uh, I think I have to say. Uh, Nina, you can go to the next slide. Um, well, first of all, my name is Kelly Max. I'm the founder and CEO of Solve. Uh, we're a social podcasting platform that just launched to market. Uh, I'm also the art and creative director for our NFT collection, which was a result of a pre-mortem methodology, and I will talk about that. Um, I have been essential in the building of Prio together with Nina Butchershop. I, I, in my former life, uh, was uh, co-founder and CEO of the Haufe Group in the United States, uh, brought them over from Germany, and um, we brought companies like Porsche, Deutsche Bahn, Roche, um, to Silicon Valley to an excursion uh, and we brought him to butcher shop and uh, when we talked about clarity all of the phones went up and they said you had the most exciting hour um, and they were at Facebook and Google and Stanford and uh, me and Trevor and, and Nina sat down and said well why is that because it was so tangible and such a great methodology uh, and so we started to, to develop a tool around the pre-mortem uh, method. I'm German born, American made. I have five sisters, one son, one dog. He didn't make it on the slide, but he it's worth mentioning. Um, all right, let's dive in. What is Solve? Solve, our mission is to become the go to social network, the creator platform for bite sized audio insights. Think of it as a TikTok uh, around uh, based on audio, but extremely focused on single questions and single topics and especially inviting more people to the online conversation than we have today by eliminating and reducing entry barriers um, and allowing for global participation equality. Now that's a lot to unpack. We're not so much to talk about that today. You're happy, you're welcome to reach out. But this is a very big mission. Um, and especially when you're in the United States, uh, when you say you're building another social network, um, there's a lot of 
bias uh, against it in the VC world, uh, especially in the VC world. We're a very venture heavy or venture needed, uh, venture capital needed company and structure because we have to get to critical mass of growth. Um, we have to usually turn on monetization once you have a critical mass of users. And also the network effects within a platform start once you have a critical mass of users. Um, and that's when the flywheel effect comes into effect. So we're dealing with a lot of, uh, I call it the bias dilemma. And the biases uh, that we're dealing with are, for example, that we're, I don't have any fang background. I was not at Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, or Google. Um, when you think about Silicon Valley, um, a lot of the investments in these types of companies are made from into former engineers or former colleagues from these companies that or that had an exit. Um, that's a big, uh, big bias that we're fighting against. Another one is, as I already mentioned, social media in general. Right? When you when you go to investors and you say, "Hey, I'm building another social network," they roll their eyes um, because you're fighting with big tech, right? Because Facebook, Twitter, usually you saw that with Clubhouse. Uh, they copy it super fast. They have a lot more capital at hand. So you really have to dive deep into um, how you can drive more value to the user. Um, then uh, as a founder, I'm not an engineer. I'm dangerous enough. Uh, I've, done, uh, I've led tech companies my whole life, um, but I'm not an engineer. I'm not the CTO. And if you don't have a tech co-founder from the start, um, you, again, you have put in a box um, and you're fighting against another bias. Um, then especially people want to see MVPs, MVPs, MVPs. Uh, it's such a big buzzword, but the truth is that in 2022, nobody wants to see a minimum viable product anymore. The user expects a product to be holistic and functioning and certain products you cannot simply validate. You can, I mean, we, we did a very lean iteration process, but you can't validate certain things unless the product is there. Um, and so, that's another dilemma that we're working with are buzzwords that are thrown around um, in, the, in the venture space. Um, ultimately, it's a highly complex endeavor, but I just wanted to highlight this today because uh, for me as a, as a founder, as a, as a te technolo technology company founder, I fight against these biases from the very beginning. So the pre-mortem is extremely helpful to me. I want to give a few examples how we use the pre-mortem, what the end result was. So when, when we started Solve, obviously the first, uh, the first question that we ask is what would, what would make Sol fail? We started at the very top, right? Take, took the entire piece uh, and said, okay, well, how can Sol fail? The beautiful thing about this process was that everybody on the team, and at that point we were very small, uh, that was about a year ago, uh, we were three people, now we're 35 people uh, a year later. Um, but the, the, the key things that came out and that everybody was able to participate were, for example, that our product strategy is not clear um, or that we don't have product market fit. That's a, it's a fair point and everybody assumes that that's a question that a startup thinks about, um, but it's something that is now in writing um, and that we were able to tackle and say, okay, how do we, how do we deal with this process and now have attention um, in the process um, or that we're missing a brand strategy. And there were many others. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a few. The outcome for us was that we dove, we created a strategy and we dove deep into product strategy. We invited experts and made sure that the strategy from actual product, core product to augmented product um, is very solid and sophisticated and it's really well thought through and that there's really a psychological need why Solve has a right to exist. In return, through that clarity, we were able to build a product, a fully functioning social network, and it's a it's a it's in beta, it's an MVP, but it's a very sophisticated MVP. Um, we were able to bring that to market in six months, where usually companies need twelve to eighteen months on average, at least here in the United States, and I believe that also goes for Europe. Um, so that was a big one for us. What we then realized, though, as you make this one big premortem you get to subtopics, right? Like what if we don't have a community? Uh, what if we only have a user-based model, but we're not building community? So we then ran another pre-mortem uh, on what could make our community engagement fail because as a social platform and the one big thing that somebody cannot steal from you is your community, at least not as easy, right? So it makes your company defensible. And so in, th in this case, the, some results were um, uh, we pretend to do something that we're not, right? So we're looking for marketing, we're looking to do all these things, but it's not really who we truly are. 
um, or the lack of ownership of creators. Uh, we have, we are a creator platform, um, and we might not have that ownership that creators can feel so that we can compete with the YouTubes and the Instagrams and the TikToks, um, or that creators are tied to the platform. And so in this case, very interestingly, um, the result was that it focused our entire point of view on web three because we realized that through web three we can actually create new engagement models a to c is a protocol that i've written uh it's the direct advertiser to creator protocol based on a smart contract where advertisers and creators now can directly create an agreement um and then we simply take royalties but the, the creators are platform agnostic to fulfill that contract which is very new within the entire creator space in the social media space um cora is stands for creative ownership rights agreement um which is basically a structure where creators who come to the platform and record their micro podcasts sorry i might, might have said that uh, in the beginning but they're basically creating micro podcasts um, they all will get a certain point of royalties into their wallet as they're creating and as their content picks up, we will revenue share through that Quora agreement uh, and that way they can make money. So that drives community engagement and buy into the platform. So that was a, um, a very interesting result that we probably would have not gotten to without this conversation. Then for this group, very important and, and for me as a startup founder, uh, especially for, for a venture focused uh, business, is what how do, what if our fundraising fails what if our seed round fails what if we can't get like it starts with family and friends then it goes into the seed round um and so what if we don't get the funding as planned right most of the companies um don't succeed because they either give up or they run out of money and and so when you think about that um that was a huge one for us uh also that we are depending on the vc market um we 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 are heavily vc heavy and we don't have access to a strong uh, venture capital network. Um, what if these things are all true? Um, and so with that one, the result and the outcome share from this conversation was that we said, let's go after the venture capital as planned, but let's create a, a creative solution, which is an NFT collection. It's a highly sophisticated, um, uh, the first inter ever interactive uh, multidisciplinary NFT collection that is called modernist um it's a brand in itself but it actually has the purpose to bring we're going to launch in the next six weeks uh six to eight weeks um and it's going to bring actually two million dollars of growth capital to solve and then it's going to bring two million dollars in the primary market into the program itself and then the secondary market we will consistently earn royalties um through that collection that allow us to one be prepared for vc doesn't go as planned um, or we're not getting into, um, uh, or we have something happening in the world. There's a lot happening in the world, right? The markets dry up. Um, we don't have access to capital. So we wanted to make ourselves independent because we wanted, didn't want to depend on the VC market. Um, I think that these are really good examples, um, just to show how the premortem methodology helps us as a startup. And the, maybe the last slide, um, uh, Nina, um, the most important, and I put this team slide here, this is by far not the entire team, uh, but we just came from of these solve houses in South by Southwest um, when we launched. The most important thing is that we have this super exciting, very bought in company culture where everybody feels to have a part of the table. And so you see here on the left, it's one of our family office uh, investors. The amount of, the, so I've done this before. And so with the premortem, it was fascinating to me to see how fast, how we can shorten the value chain of building a relationship with potential investors or existing investors and having buy-in, creating trust throughout that process. Uh, we have big goals. We want to have, uh, we want to, we're seeking unicorn status within the next three to five years. Um, and so the premortem really helped us to shorten the value chain for one side for the investor, one side for us and for the team. And now we have this very, high buy-in culture as a startup that we need um, and so for us our mission to beat failure continues it will continue as a team um, and i'm happy to talk to any one of you uh, at any time uh, separately uh, if you want to dive in deeper but thanks for having me and i hope this this helps great thank you kelly um, 
I think that was just a really, really perfect example of showing how Kelly used the pre-mortem in multiple moments where he had inflection points and big questions to answer and then created solutions to solve those. So in conclusion, you should use the pre-mortem for all these things, but think about other moments where you can be using it too. You can go as broad as what will make my investment fail or as detailed as you know, what will make this next meeting fail. So you can really make it your own with your team and sort of choose how you want to approach it. Um, overall, the benefits, I think I don't need to talk through these in detail, but it really gives you the platform to cut to the chase and talk about some of the really important things that a typical meeting format does not allow for you. You're talking about failure in a constructive way in order to succeed and build a strategy. Um, and you're really, um, you're, you're providing that accountability and that clarity and all the things that you need to help clean up the process of things that's so difficult typically for you. And ultimately, you want to increase the success rate of your portfolio and you want to get higher returns and this can really help you. So what now? Um, just some food for thought. Think of moments where you can use this um, and give it a try. You can do it uh, analog on post-its. Butcher Shop offers facilitated workshops. We do this regularly. Um, myself, Katinka's on the call. We can facilitate these for you and your team as a group if you just want to be a participant and not have to deal with the method. So if you do, let me know. We're here. Um, also check out prio.com if you just want to explore. We use this digital tool that we created, um, which is the digitized version of the pre-mortem. So you can really do it anywhere in the world with anybody, especially in these remote times. So with us and with the pre-mortem, you can't actually beat failure. And um, I thank everyone for your time. Um, and I think, Anno, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Uh, well, um, I told you the, your seatbelt needed to be fastened because it was a very intense presentation, a lot of information, a lot of um, a new concept, new, new approach. So thank you very much for all these details. Uh, thank you, Kelly, too, for your own experience, which illustrates what uh, Butcher Shop is, uh, is, is, is offering. Um, now, if someone in the audience has, has a question, I, um, I, I will be pleased to, uh, to relay this question. Um, I will allow myself to ask the first question, uh, Nina, to you. Um, maybe now we, we, we see your offering and uh, it would be interesting to know the, the, the business model of, uh, of uh, Butcher Shop. What, what, how is it structured? How do you work with your customers? Uh, you're, you're preventing failure. Does it mean that you are rewarded with success? Um, yeah, no, great, great question. Um, well, you know, we are a growth and transformation company, but we are a agency. So we're project-based in terms of the clients that we're working with. Um, and when we are, when, when inquiries are coming and companies are coming to us to work with us, we always ask this first question of before we even engage in any kind of talks of contracts or things like that, we talk about what's going to cause you to fail. And so we use this failure conversation as a business development tool to really understand who we're working with, what are their problems, can we solve them, or can those top ranked items, are some of those butcher shop, or are they other problems, because we really want to make sure that we're coming in, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that we work with about 25 clients a year, so we want to make sure that we're really able to problem solve at the level that the company needs us to, so if a company is coming to us and saying, we just want to create a website, our website is old, that's not what we do. And so we can weed out those type of um, uh, engagements with clients and make sure we're really talking to the ones that we want to. And we are a uh, creative agency, do consulting, and uh, our strengths lie specifically in strategy, discovery, branding, and execution. So that's where really, where once we engage with a client, um, we can then, build brands for them, build new positioning for them, create really strong strategies for them for their new um, inflection points of what they're tackling, whether they're scaling to a new market or a new country, or they're trying to launch something. Um, that's really where we come in. And we also offer these workshops um, beforehand or, or during the process as well to really ensure that we're doing the right thing. 
Okay, we are clear. Um, I see a comment from uh, Thomas, um, who is, uh, while well, very enthusiastic about you coming to Vienna, and is wondering um, how you made the choice to establish your headquarters in Vienna. Yeah, my favorite question, because so many people <laughs> in Vienna love to ask this, um, and it's a great question. So we had, um, coming from San Francisco, before the pandemic, we were only in San Francisco in terms of our location. And we had been working with US-based companies, but we also had the pleasure of working with European companies, um, Haufe that Kelly um, worked at. Um, that was a huge European client of ours. So we sort of dabbled in the European space. And then during the pandemic, we decided to lean into the pandemic and sort of um, really embrace the new world of work. And we shut down our office in the financial district. We had a wonderful building with hot pink windows that we were known for. And we shut it down and decided to go completely remote so that we can become more global. So we grew from a 25 person agency before the pandemic to 125. And now we are in multiple hubs. Um, and me having been at butcher shop for so long, and I moved to Germany for my German husband. So for personal reasons, it was a great opportunity to say, hey, look, we've built some great relationships in Europe. We have an offering that we think can be really interesting and very helpful specifically for the Dach market. And we wanted to start in Vienna because Vienna is such a wonderful space in terms of location, culture, um, venture opportunities, and just the investments overall being brought in in the startup programs. Um, we really noticed that it's a great place to lay our European roots and start there. We could not agree more. It's beautiful. <laughs> I want to travel to Vienna all the time. So, um, and that's what I'll be doing. That's fantastic. Um, tell me if I understood this uh, uh, not correctly, but um, the um, expansion, the generation of this uh, butcher shop um, concept and ID has, um, has um, come from collaborations, cooperations with, with, with customers, but also with, with partners. Um, and it, it seems that necessary also to, um, to offer your services also in Europe with collaboration, with partners. How do you intend to, to build this, this own ecosystem, so to say, your own community here in, in Europe? Yeah, well, what we've been doing so far is, of course, being able to speak at events like this, identify areas of partnership that we know can be helpful, such as Avco and being able to um, tap into the network here. Um, we are pumping a lot of content through thought leadership and articles. Der Brutkasten is posting our articles almost weekly right now um, on topics of failure, um, trends, what's happening in the Silicon Valley. Um, and we're also looking for um, various partnerships um, that are within the um, Vienna industry, such as uh, agencies and things like that, where we can extend our expertise and bring that over as well. So um, it's a very butcher shop thing to not force ways. We want to be organic. We want to follow opportunities. We want to follow leads. And a lot of the introductions that we've been given, um, a lot of the awareness efforts that we've put in have already put us in contact with some really incredible people. And um, there's some, there's a lot to come. You guys will be hearing a lot more about butcher shop definitely in the next uh, six months. And in oh, great. Well, which means that in, in this period, you're also using the uh, butcher shop methods yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, but that, at, at, for your development, for your, um, so at, at which moment? Yeah, so it is a, it's become our most important business development tool. Um, we okay. used to yeah. do this years ago. So we've been doing this for years at Butcher Shop. I used to, I used to manage our project management team um, a few years back. And we made this a, we made the pre-mortem a crucial moment um, when we kicked off projects. So we signed a contract, we assigned a team, we did a kickoff with a client. Then we would do an internal pre-mortem with our team on all of our concerns of what would cause this project to fail. Because we were about to engage in a six month to one year project with a client at very high budgets. We really wanted to see what's going to cause us to fail. And then we started, it was so powerful and so helpful, we started opening it up to our clients. We were like, well, we should hear what they have to say. What do they think is going to cause 
our project with them to fail. And we started seeing that it just became so impactful and helpful that outside of just our project work, we started using it in just conversations during business development. And now we use the digital tool that we used. And that's helped us identify the right clients. It's helped us build really re great relationships with them because you're creating this incredible bond early on by talking about what you're worried about in a really constructive platform. And then also just for butcher shop culture, the people and culture is one of the most incredible parts of butcher shop, not just our work and our talent and things like that. But I think anybody, if you ask anybody who worked at butcher shop, people are there for the people. And that's because we invest so much in our culture and we use the pre-mortem for really important moments. So a lot of our internal initiatives around, um, planning performance reviews about uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, what's going to cause butcher shop to fail? We ask that ourselves regularly, and then we implement initiatives, programs, events to prevent those failures from happening that we hear from our own employees. So we shut down our office and now we're going to, we fly everywhere. Every, we fly people all around the world to collaborate. We're all going to Costa Rica in May, all 125 of us to have just a full company event together. That was one of the results of our pre-mortems as a company is how are we all gonna stay connected? How are we supposed to be creative and work together and collaborate through Zoom all the time? So Butcher Shop created um, hubs in different places, Vienna being one of them, opportunities um, to meet. Every person at Butcher Shop has a credit card, which is unheard of. <laughs> um, and we want people to have that flexibility. And so those are all decisions that we made based on doing pre-mortems on what would cause butcher shop to fail. Okay. Um, I have other questions. <laughs> um, well, if, if, um, if we look at, um, at your model, we, you know, we are a community of investors. Um, AFCO is gathering uh, um, um, uh, venture capital and, 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 and private equity investors. So there is here one good question. Um, when you see very interesting projects, do you have also the uh, possibility, the tendency, uh, the, um, um, and, and uh, do you invest in your uh, own customers? Is there any additional VC step you're, you have made, you're making, you plan to make? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, we go through regular um, standard contracts with clients as well, but Butcher Shop also can take equity or we share equity with our clients in return as well. Solve with Kelly Max here is um, a wonderful example of that. Butcher Shop built the or did the development of the app. And I believe that there's an equity share in that as well, because we believe in this app and we believe in Kelly. Um, so we have done that multiple times with, with many different types of clients. And Butcher Shop also has a venture arm of our own uh, where we build our own products. Uh, it's called Imagine Buy. And we have um, multiple projects right now being built within that. Prio, um, the, the app that I showed you earlier, mentioned earlier, um, as that I'm the co-founder from is one of our venture products. And I was able to become a co-founder of an app because Butcher Shop created that platform for people to be able to have equity and, and build products. So um, we're definitely in that space as well. And it's very important to us um, to sort of create that kind of culture and knowledge for our employees as well. It's a good, uh, maybe if I can chime in. Am yes. I, um, yeah. Uh, sure. If I could chime in, I think this is a really good example um, because for me, as a as a founder, right, and also for you as an investor, you never want to hear that as a tech company, your tech is outsourced, right? That's not really what you want to invest in. You want to invest in a full team, uh, at least in, in our space, uh, that has the technical co-founder. Now, when I approached... Um, Trevor, the founder, is a really good friend of mine as well. We worked for eight years. We're a team and a dream uh, since many, many, many times. But from the outside, it looks like we have an outsourced team. We actually ran a pre-mortem. We could say, what could make this setup fail? What could make this structure fail? And so the result was that Butcher Shop is not, we're not a client necessarily to Butcher Shop or Butcher Shop is our vendor. We, Butcher Shop has a 5% stake in the company. We integrated the team. 
so that the team actually has agreements. Once the time is right, they can easily move over and transition to solve and we can build the in-house team. So the culture between us is very different. It's literally like butcher shop and the, 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 the Mexican uh, team, especially we have a CTO, we have product managers, we have product owners, but they were fully integrated in the salt culture. Uh, so it's a very different agreement. And if we, I believe, I want to say, if we would have not done the pre-mortem, these things would have not come up and we would have not tackled them the right way so that we now have this powerhouse that we've been able to create. So just another point, but it was a really good like, real life example where, especially in this case, the pre-mortem can help. We all face these moments where like, yeah, it's kind of good, but something's missing or it doesn't check the boxes, but it feels right. And in these moments, really using a premortem helps extremely to get to these last 20% to find a good, confident decision to either invest or to partner, uh, et cetera. Great, but well, maybe a final question. If this method of this methodology is, um, is so great, um, if I did listen correctly, um, you just target a very limited number of uh, customers per year. So um, how are the other one going to go to success when they don't have you on board? They need butcher shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are expanding and growing like crazy. So I feel like that number has definitely gone up. Um, but we can also Good. offer our uh, consulting services. So when I say that we offer, you know, we work with around 25 to 30, you know, uh, companies a year, yes. those are our large scale, massive projects. Um, but we also can consult, uh, me being over here in Europe opens a whole new um, opportunity to work with Austrian or Dach market startups who are looking to expand to the US, who are looking to um, bring us in to conduct these workshops. Um, we can also connect them because um, often there are budgetary issues as well. Sometimes these startups don't have the finances or the means yet in order to maybe work with a company like Butcher Shop, but we can connect them still to other people as well because we want to be as helpful as possible. So we can still offer other services in that sense as well. Um, and if, um, you know, we've worked, like I said, with many VCs in the past, Lightspeed um, in the Silicon Valley has been a big partner of ours. And we've done not only work for the Lightspeed brand and positioning, but Lightspeed has brought us in to do work for some of their um, portfolio companies as well. So at least 10 of their companies, they've brought us in to do positioning and branding and workshops for them as well. Um, so we've been sort of brought into that VC world on, on both sides of not just doing the work for the VC, but also for their startups. We can do larger projects or bring us in from a consulting standpoint let us do a workshop, see what those results are and see how we can help. So don't be deterred by the number. If someone is interested, then please reach out to me. We're happy to have a conversation and see how we can help further. That's good. So that means we will see you more often in Vienna. Absolutely. And I know at least one next opportunity. This is in May. You plan to um, present uh, a butcher shop um, during Connect Day. Yep. That is going to be immediately after um, our investors' uh, breakfast. Again, uh, just a call to our um, um, uh, members. Um, you find all information in our newsletter to uh, uh, just enroll for this, uh, for this investors' breakfast. Um, this is uh, during Vienna Up. Um, I don't have any uh, additional questions, but I think this is already a lot of information to uh, integrate, to understand. Um, I think with the help of your presentation, um, um, the audience will also be able to um, catch up and to, uh, to um, uh, understand the whole concept. You will certainly have some follow-up uh, uh, discussions or calls uh, later on. So let me thank you very much, uh, Nina, Katinka and Kelly for um, um, this uh, presentation uh, today um, and um, all the success uh, for Butcher Shop. Uh, father in uh, the Dach region. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful thank day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.